thank you for joining us, Mr. Gansler. We're excited to have you here as one of the possible candidates for governor in the 2014 election, and we certainly appreciate your service as the Attorney General. First, you get three questions. Tell us about how you see the future of Maryland and your vision for our state. Can you share with us your unique background, interests, and priorities for Maryland's future? Well, thank you, Betty, and thank you uh, for having me. It's, um, I was always nervous as a kid in front of one teacher, so this is a little rough for me. But, um, <laughs> you know, I think in order to have uh, a vision, you have to have credibility, and you have to have a set of accomplishments that you feel good about that you're doing. Uh, the right thing for the right reasons and can articulate those reasons. And I, I believe that I've done that. And, and we come to uh, work every day with seeing a problem and fighting for people. So whether it's getting caffeinated alcoholic beverages out of the hands of kids, uh, fighting, uh, setting up the first domestic violence dockets, setting up family uh, justice centers, uh, getting mortgage settlements for people, um, or, or leading the charge for the uh, Affordable Care Act in the United States for the states. I think these are all important issues. Then you sort of look at how do you pivot that into the future? What are the needs uh, for the future? And obviously, uh, in my mind, there's two uh, in particular that stand out. Uh, one is the economy of Maryland and how do we sort of take ourselves and become much more competitive instead of losing all our jobs to states around nearby in Virginia and Pennsylvania and so forth. And then two is education because you can't be pro-business without being pro-education. <coughs> and I think um, obviously since I'm, I'm here, I want to talk about the education piece a little bit, if I could, uh, in terms of the future. You know, I, one thing we have to do is protect our pensions for the teachers. Two is we have to recognize the value of teachers. Everybody uh, has, is, is where they are in our society because of a teacher. What, whoever that teacher might have been that made you click the switch to get you to learn, um, I think our teachers are underpaid. I think our teachers are undervalued. I think it's the most important profession that we can have as a state in, in terms of our future. I think we ought to, though, look a little bit differently down the road as to what we should do with our teachers. One thing, for example, right now that the, the law is that you have to stay in school till you're 18. I think we should consider that once you're 16, uh, be able to go to a separate track if you want to go into vocational training, work with unions, work with labor, so the kids that don't want to sit there that are 17, 17, 18 year old and don't want to be in school anymore can learn a trade, whether it's pipe fitting, brick laying, be an electrician, can do that through our public schools working with labor to ha so they come out prepared for our, our workforce. Obviously we have to look at STEM, we have to look at uh, vocational training, technical training, and other things in the future. But we really need to uh, also just protect labor in general and teachers as well. And I think that we can be pro-business in terms of our tax structure without compromising uh, what we do for unions. Thank you. Second question. MSEA has never been a single issue organization. We have had an expansive legislative and social justice agenda, which has overlapped at the local and state level with your work as an elected official. Can you share an example of an issue you have partnered with MSEA on, or one of our local affiliates, in pursuit of a shared priority? Well, I think as a statewide elected official and the head law enforcement officer of the state and the head lawyer of the state, we do a number of things that certainly touch upon it. When I set up the first civil rights division in the state's history, that was one of them. Setting up drug courts is another. Setting up family violence dockets is another. We worked very carefully and closely when I was the state's attorney uh, of Montgomery County with MSEA in terms of getting uh, gangs out of schools. I set up the first gang unit there and, and then through the state. You can't expect children to learn if there are gang members in the classroom. I remember I recently spoke to a middle school and there were, um, the principal came up and talked to me about how 85% of the kids in that school in Baltimore City were me gang members. That you can't expect a child to learn, you can't expect a teacher to be safe in that environment. So I think that's, those are some of the areas. The maintenance of effort uh, is a specific area where I took a lot of heat actually from local officials in protecting what I thought was important that we maintain, that we protect the maintenance of effort laws, that we make sure we have proper funding for the schools. Um, and, and we were able to, to, to do that. Setting up the public school uh, labor relations board was another, getting the regulations in line uh, was something that we worked very hard on. We, when I first became attorney general, I set up the attorney general labor council, which brought uh, labor from all over the state together to talk about issues of collective bargaining, issues that are important to labor in general uh, and, and teachers in particular is one of the issues that we, we've worked on. So I think a lot of different issues that touch upon the schools, um, 
And then last would be the environment. You know, we need to, uh, I, I know the environment doesn't necessarily directly affect teachers, but I talk to kids all the time in classrooms about my top priority, which is uh, making sure we protect the Chesapeake Bay, prosecute polluters, go after people who would hurt our future and our environment. Thank you. Last question, this seems to be everybody's favorite. Typically, everyone has at least one educator who made an outsized impact on their life. Who is that educator for you, and how did he or she shape how you think about education and who you are today? Well, it's interesting when you talk about educators. Um, my mother's a public school teacher. My father is a professor. I teach as well. Um, and so there's so many educators that really affect us, and it's easy to sort of point to a teacher, the one that really got to us, or the, the few that got to us. Um, but I think the most important educator in my life was my, well, first were my parents, and second were my children. Um, and it, it, it re I mean, that's really the answer. I know that's not what you want, but those are the ones that taught me right from wrong, and, and my kids are the ones that keep me uh, in line right now and teach me, you know, Twitter and Facebook and all that kind of stuff. So, <laughs> so those are the big ones. But um, the, the real one, I guess, you know, it, when, when thinking about sort of the most uh, pivotal educational moment of, uh, moment of li my life was when I was a senior in high school. It was a little later. And I um, w w had to graduate early from high school because I was getting in trouble on the one hand and had exhausted all the courses on the other. Um, I, I wanted to go to Yale, um, and that was, and I ended up going to Yale, but I hadn't gotten in yet. And they, they were worried that I might jeopardize that if I stayed around. So I went and lived <laughs> in Uruguay. And um, my parents knew somebody who knew somebody in, in, in Montevideo, Uruguay. And I went down there uh, to, for a, to I basically graduate a semester early, not technically, but really. And I sat down with a teacher, uh, Miss Yandorf, and, and who you know I was really scared of. She used to throw pencils. You can't do that anymore at the bad kids. <laughs> but um, and, and designed a class. And what, what mattered to me at that time is is the, her involvement with me as an individual. You know, I think we, we constantly talk to teachers about teaching to the test, and I think that does not make any sense to me at all. I think we need to individualize and be subjective as teachers. And, and, and we need to reach each kid and understand each kid comes from a different cultural background, a different perhaps ethnic background, a different socioeconomic background, and, and has different needs. And I, at that time, needed to, to be different. And so we designed a class in existentialism that I could take. We didn't have cell phones or we didn't have computers, so it couldn't be a daily deal or Skype. Um, I ended up reading 21 books about existential novels when I was there and wrote a poem every day while I was living in Uruguay and I was working in a leather belt factory with people who were very different from where I was. I learned to speak Spanish fluently at the time, and we'd sit on uh, stacks of, of cowhide drinking yerba mate, talking about uh, their ambitions, and they, they were very different than sort of wh what I had come from and where I was. But I really valued the relationship that I, that I had with the teacher that seemed to care about me, and then we went, after when I got back, I was so somewhat different, in, I think, in mindset, and going over what I learned and what the values not only in the classroom, but outside of the classroom were. And there was no test, there was no circles to fill in. It was really teaching me how to want to learn, how to want to read. And that really actually made me, from then on, I've been a reader. I read every night before I go to sleep. My children read every night before they go to sleep. And I think that that moment was probably part of, of the analysis. Wow, thank you. And your time is not quite up yet, so if there's anything else you'd like to share with the, with the delegates. Well, you know, uh, you said at the beginning you were talking about running for governor. I don't think uh, anyone's running for governor yet. I'd like to think, but we are. We do have an election coming up, and I was honored and, and privileged to chair uh, Barack Obama's campaign four years ago with Elijah Cummings. And I think um, this election, both in terms of, of where our country will be going, is critical to make sure people vote, and I think that's part of education, pe that people should be educated and, and children should be educated. We actually vote so often in our schools. And I think that that's a good thing because we want to make sure people understand the value of the vote. And I think in my mind, in Maryland this time, there's two issues that I've, are very dear to me. Uh, one is the DREAM Act. And, and I think that I'm, I'm very much, I, I for one, am, I'm very in favor of that. I think we all came from uh, somewhere else. Um, we, we, none of us were born in our relatives in the United States. And, and immigrants are su make such a huge difference in our country. In fact, half the Fortune 500 companies were founded by first or second generation immigrants. And the second is marriage equality. I, I've been testifying for it for years. I've been out front on it. We wrote the opinion to have recognized out-of-state same-sex marriage here in Maryland. I think it says so much about who we are as a people. If we vote in favor of uh, marriage equality, everybody should have 
the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So I'm interested in these next 17 days, and I would implore you as teachers to get out and push people to vote for whichever positions they might have. And thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Kevin.